During the Roman and Anglo-Saxon times, this area was developed as two settlements along the riverside, with the Roman fort or beer in the south and Tymouth Priory on the northern headland. For much of Shields history, the sea and coal have been its lifeblood. Now, with the mines gone, the fish quay in the port of Tyne remain a vibrant reminder of nearly 800 years of culture and tradition. The two harbour towns felt at the time, this was in the middle of the 19th century, that Newcastle had this monopoly over the river that was to their detriment. Effectively, you couldn't do anything on the river. You couldn't build a ship, you couldn't import anything, you couldn't export anything, you couldn't take on ballast, you couldn't dump ballast without you had to pay dues to Newcastle. In the 1850s and before that, Newcastle dominated the river through Trinity House. They controlled all of the um, import and export. So when Customs House was built in 1863 and it became a Customs House in 1865, it was a really massive, massive statement about South Shields because it gave them their own Customs House and made them a port which allowed them to import and export, which in fact allowed money to be made and kept in this town rather than everything going up to Newcastle. By turns though, Newcastle wasn't spending the money on the maintenance of the river so that quite often it silted up to the detriment of shipping. A ship could try and get up the river, it would get stranded, it could be stuck for two or three days sometimes. And North and South Shields wanted to break this monopoly. Well, we were originally the North and South Shields Gazette. So James Stevenson, who founded the Gazette and who was um, owner of the Jarrell Chemical Works, he was one of the instigators of establishing this paper as a voice of protest, as a voice of campaign, which is how it came about. And it followed on from there that you had the establishment of the Tyne Improvement Commission eventually, which of course brought about the construction of the, the piers, which was to the benefit of the river, it stopped this silting up, and eventually the establishment of the Port of Shields as a separate customs port. The riverside of the two towns were almost mirror images of each other, with industry below and houses above, connected by steep winding stairs. On both sides the buildings were tightly packed up to the steep banks, and many were overcrowded. Yeah, I mean, when I left school, I think 62, 61, I went in the pilot office. All my family worked down here, my father was like the, the, the chief uh, skipper, uh, my brother Paul, Michael, um, all worked on the cutters and obviously I wanted to do that. When I came out of the pilot office I came down and was what they call hut boy on the uh, one time there was a hut down here so everybody used to stay in this hut horrible brown thing um, and then later I progressed on the pilot cutters uh, as a deckhand. Uh, I was only a young lad then I mean I was only 16 year old and what we used to do a good thing was the fishermen uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the guys actually were from South Shields, not North Shields, on the big trawlers. Uh, and when we used to go over and pick these guys up, they used to, to blow up our, a long and a three on, on the whistle on the trawler. And we used to go over, go, and baskets of prawns used to come over, fish, uh, the whole cut and caboodle. I mean, we used to love it. Um, but it was good, it was exciting, um, fantastic times. I was on the trawlers for nine years in North Shields. And after that, I, I journeyed around the country as well, different, different ports. Fishing up off Iceland, Norwegian White Sea, Bering Sea. It was a factory freezer ship, so we used to catch all sorts of fish. It was all processed on board. It was gutted, skinned. We even had fish meal, which was a big surprise to me when I joined with saving fish meal, saving liver oils and everything was frozen into seven pound blocks and it was put in the freezer hold and the fish meal was put in a big tank which the crew had to go down and trim off every so often well it was a stinking job tr trimming fish meal and then there was liver oil that all the livers had to be collected and that was processed and put into different tanks 
We had to do this all between, in seven weeks, 14 weeks, different amount of weeks. By the time we got ashore, we were really knackered. We used to supply uh, the deep sea trawler boats, which used to go to sea for 14 days with 14 men on board up to Iceland. Uh, a few of these skippers used to come from South Shields and the crew members used to come from South Shields, not just North Shields. Well, things have changed over the years. Uh, we were 95% fishing vessels, supplying them all the time and 5% uh, customers. But it's a full reversal now where it's 95% customers and 5% fishing boats. Unfortunately, the, the days of fishing seem to have really depleted. Uh, I hope it never actually dies out because it would be an awful shame. North Shields is an extremely busy prawn port with a strong winter fishery which attracts up to 60 to 70 visitors from fishing ports in Northern Ireland and Scotland as well as the local fleet at North Shields. North Shields is now the busiest fishing port on the east coast of England and has overtaken ports such as Grimsby and Hull which had a traditional fishing history. Every morning there's a, there's a fish market at North Shields Monday to Friday which starts at 7.30 in the morning. This is a trade market where local merchants come down and buy fish that's been caught and landed by the boats at North Shields. Any prawns that are landed at North Shields tend to be sold privately and are stored in our chill storage facility before being transported up to Scotland. In the summer the market tends to be a little bit more quiet as the fishing dies down. However in the winter there can be hundreds and hundreds of boxes of fish. Mixtures of white fish such as cod, haddock and mainly whiten, as well as some prime flatfish such as turbot, brill and anglerfish as well. As well as managing day to day fishing activities, North Shields Fish Key has become a hub for transport for fish. We have three chill storage fridges here which are used by the local merchants to store, to store their fish and they also have fish delivered here. When boats land their fish and prawns it is put immediately into the chillers to keep it fresh and then it's used by large haulage companies to transport away. We also have an ice plant here, which, which can make up to 900 kilos of flake ice an hour. This is used by the boats, so they can ice their catch to keep it fresh. All the foundations are in place for North Shields to have a strong fish and future, as it, as it is an important part of the economy here. However, we are always at the hands of nature, but as long as the, the prawn fishery continues, then the future looks good for North Shields. People have been crossing the River Tyne by boat for as long as there have been communities either side of the river. From early as 1825, when a suspension bridge was proposed, serious thought had been given to alternative links between North and South Shields. A number of ambitious plans for bridges and tunnels were conceived and abandoned before the Tyne Tunnel opened in 1967. Ferries connecting different points in North and South Shields have come and gone over the years. Steamships, known as Penny Ferries, began to operate in 1828. The Happeny Dodger would take foot passengers by the direct route straight across the river from the new quay on the north side of the river to Comical Corner on the south side. I'm sitting here in the South Shields Central Library because I work here as a librarian, but I've lived in North Shields for the past 10 years and that means I travel to work every day by the ferry. And what I love about um, working in South Shields and living in North Shields um, and being able to travel to work on the ferry every day is, is the River Tyne. Um, from where I live you can see it right across to South Shields and I can see the Town Hall and I can see Arbea and in the distance we can see the Cleeton Water Tower and then coming back the other way when I'm travelling home I can see uh, Tymouth Priory, you can see the Collingwood Monument, the highlights and the lowlights and the Fish Quay and it gives you such a sense of place and a sense of um, being part of something as well I think. Both North and South Shields create many cultural and entertainment events, including the Mouth of the Tyne Festival, organised these past 10 years by North Tyneside Council. South Tyneside has its own annual festival during the summer with major acts at Bent's Park. 
add the work of the Customs House at Mildam, South Shields Museum and the RBL Roman Fort and you have a vibrant mix of entertainment and culture in both North and South Shields. Can we have closer cooperation between North and South Shields along the lines of Newcastle Gateshead? This could perhaps happen by reconnecting North and South with a direct pedestrian route. Initiatives have included a cable car link between the Fish Quay and Mill Dam in South Shields, or a temporary floating bridge in summer which would have a central section that opens for passing river traffic. If we look abroad to other cities and places, you find that they have made the bridge, this example in Sweden, where, where we are now, could have a temporary footbridge. These are sort of pontoons that, that can be removed, but can be allowed for shipping, but be, can be put in place for the pedestrians to make their way across. There's other ideas. So it, it's sort of important that there could be developments carried out to join up the two places. Let us hope that one of these initiatives becomes a reality and the bonds between North and South Shields are strengthened.